Hello and welcome back to Mikey's Flytech. In this episode I will show you how you can build an electric panel for your Boeing 737 overhead panel. Yes! Yes! <laughs> I finally made it! <laughs> Guys, when I started the work on this panel 16 months ago, I couldn't imagine how long it would take me until this segment of the overhead panel is finished. But here it is, a self-designed electric panel with a self-designed PCB in the background, not self-made, but I will come to this later. And this will be a video that uh, will be different from all the other panel building videos you have seen before. To build this panel, I came across nearly all ups and downs that come across your way when you are making such a panel. And the footage I have here is very old and shows many different tries I have started to make this panel here. And so we will have a look into the different tries I took and I will explain something to you from time to time. And let's see this video as a journey through the development of this panel here. A very important part of this panel section are the 14 seven segment displays that are located in the upper part of this panel. You can't connect all the pins of these seven segment displays with single wires and so you have to come out with some kind of PCB where you can place them onto. And the first thing I tried was to make my own PCB on my CNC router. You have seen the video where I have introduced you into making PCBs on a router. The first try was a success, but it only was a single-sided PCB. Now here with 14 LED elements and the corresponding controllers, there are many more connections to make and a single-sided PCB wouldn't be enough for this. So I had to make a double-sided PCB. And there are some techniques to make double-sided PCBs on a router. And one of these is that you align the raw uh, copper PCB with um, some holes on the sacrificial layer of your router, engrave one side, turn it around, engrave the other side, and so you should come out with two perfectly aligned sides. So let's see how I've done this. Here I'm back at my CNC router. And by the way, from time to time I'm getting questions concerning this machine. What type is this? And guys, this is a homemade CNC router. And this is a project that is also documented on my channel. Go back in my video history from video number 25 on. You have a five video series that describes the building of this machine in detail. But back to PCB making now. This time here with a double sided copper plate. And you have seen I have planned these four alignment holes. And now I think I'm searching here for a place where I can drill these holes into my sacrificial layer. I think somewhere like here. And then I can fix the board with these two millimeter nails and get them in there. And this will help me to align this cover plate in the exact same orientation after I have rotated it to route out the back cover plate. So the both layers are engraved and I think they are on the opposite side to each other. I hope. We'll see after drilling. But before we drill and cut out the board, 
I have to apply the solder mask and to protect the rest of the board from the liquid I will mask it out with some tape to save it for a later project or another tryout if necessary. I have shown you the way to apply a solder mask in my PCB making video before. This time I forgot to add the wire points to my exposure mask and so I added them manually. But the resulting mask wasn't really satisfying. Some more tries followed. The isolation routing and the drilling came out perfectly. My only problem is still the solder mask. And again on this side of the PCB there are some parts that aren't covered exactly with a solder mask. It has loosened itself and sticked to the plastic sheet instead of the copper layer here. I think it must be a combination between exposure time, thickness of the layer and the plastic sheet. And I think I have found the right thickness and plastic sheet now and have still to experiment with the exposure time or the way I expose it. So I will need to invest some more evenings to test this out. But for now I will work with this PCB as it is now because I think it will do its job and I don't want to invest another evening producing such a PCB. Now I have to create the wires from one side of the PCB to the other here. And for this purpose I have bought these rivets here and these are uh, copper rivets that can be sticked into some of the uh, drillings and, and then flattened on the other side of the PCB with some tools. But we'll cover this now in detail. I have planned to use these IC holders here to mount the MAX chip onto it and so I can change it without desoldering it if it might be damaged in the future. But now after I've installed these 0.6mm copper rivets, this holder doesn't fit in there anymore. The legs are a little bit thicker than the legs of the chip. and. I can't remove them anymore here and so I have decided to solder the chips directly onto the board and if I need a new one I can make another PCB with some wider holes in the future. But this PCB didn't work. No 7 segment display was lighted up when I connected it to the Arduino. Yes, and so it wasn't useful for me. But there's uh, no chance of giving up and I have designed another PCB. And this PCB uh, was made to be connected to such an 
already soldered a MAX component and there are connectors in the PCB that can be connected to the needed pins of this MAX component here and so I hope I can get rid of any mistakes that can be made during soldering these chips onto the board or any resistors, something like this. But when I tested this new PCB after I've milled it, I found out what could be the failure on the first try. And this is when the router bit does all the engraving into the board. You can come out with some chips that um, rest between some thin lines that you route out. And these chips can be bent because of the rotation of the uh, engraving bit onto another pad. And this can cause some shorts on your PCB. So when you are making PCBs on your CNC, you have to check every solder pad and every wire that is isolated on it after you have milled it. So I'm not done with this topic of integrating a Max chip on a PCB, but I will save this for a later project. Now I will try with these components and first I have to get rid of all the components that I won't need now. To make the boards usable for my needs, I sorted out the female connectors and replaced them by male ones. After this disappointing results with this liquid solar mask and because I had to make a new PCB anyway, I wanted to try out another solar mask. And this is this sprayable green coat, you apply it on your PCB let it dry for approximately five minutes and then you have a time window where you can solder through this mask and onto your PCB. Then after two days of drying or a short time of drying in your oven, it isn't solderable anymore. This isn't the mask you should use when you want to prepare a PCB, applying a green coat and then make the solder work some days later. When you apply this mask, you have to do the solder mask directly after this. To let only the seven segment displays be visible, I cut out a foam mask for the PCB. Finally, I started making all the needed panel layers. The last time I've painted the different layers of the panel separated from each other. I have masked the parts out that shouldn't be painted and then sprayed them all separately. And this I have done because I was afraid that the parts could stick together on the sides and when I loosen them to assemble all the components in here then I would cause some cracks in the lacquer. But this is a very time-consuming process and so I want to try this time making all of the panels at once. So I have assembled the three layers together and try to spray over them and so all the parts that should be painted will be painted after and I want to try to disassemble the layers a little bit earlier than um, the time when the lacquer has fully dried and then I hope I can prevent it from cracking. Unnecessary to say that this method wasn't a success and this was because of several reasons. One of this is when you put several layers of acrylic on top of each other, you can't achieve a state that they all are perfectly flat with no gaps on top of each other. And so when you spray around 
these uh, sheets, then paint can come between these layers where you don't want to have it. Maybe you remember the video where I made my first knobs for the EFIS panel. There I had such a problem. So this can lead to a state that you uh, can't remove the sheets from each other or they have a little gap between each others when paint comes between them. Another reason is that at points where um, a sharp corner uh, is made, for example, when you have a bigger cutout for a button or a switch and then the smaller cutout for the mounting hole of the switch. In these uh, corners, the paint will go away from this corner and then backlighting can come through this corner. So you won't come out with an even coating at all places. And of course, the last reason, um, the danger that the paint uh, can crack and this is what it has done at some time. And this is what it has done uh, on some places of the panel. And so later I have decided that I again mask out the parts that don't have to be painted uh, of the bottom or uh, the middle panel and spray around these panels like I have done before. I had to make a second backlighting panel after I realized that I made a mistake and installed ultraviolet LED stripes. A lot of soldering and desoldering work, but at the end it wasn't a success too. And I think the reason that this uh, try failed too was uh, again that the homemade PCB wasn't good enough and when there is the smallest short on the circuit board um, it won't work. Finally, I gave up trying and making the double-sided PCB on my router. Meanwhile, I have bought a serial 2 laser and I tried to make the PCB on the laser. The idea behind this is that you spray paint the copper black and burn away everything that should be uncoppered later. Then you put it into an etching bath, the copper um, disappears and when you then wipe away the remaining paint then there should be only these um,
couple lines left. I tried this on uh, some uh, single-sided uh, PCBs which finally came out nice but not every time and again the soda mask was a disaster. I even started some tries to apply soda mask with uh, screen printing techniques but I didn't invest too much time in testing this and so I gave up this really fast. The etching was first made in a self-made etching bath and later then in a little bit more professional etching station. Let's have a look into some of the tries there. Now it comes to engrave all these isolation lines here on this PCB with my laser. And, and for this the piece here has to be positioned exactly and the laser has to know where this piece is positioned. And there comes the tricky part. The honeycomb bed of my laser is wiggling a little bit when I move it up and down. I have to keep in mind I have bought the cheapest laser I can get in this size here. So um, there are some cheap parts um, built in and it isn't worth to um, modify um, the mechanic in there. And so I have to use a little trick here. I will use a scrap piece of HDF board which I lay down to the honeycomb table and uh, secure it with some magnets here so that it isn't moving anymore. And then I'm cutting out uh, the outline of this PCB a little bit wider than this piece so I can get it in there. And now the laser knows the orientation of this piece when I lay it in there. Maybe you remember my uh, ethos panel building where I have uh, engraved these EFIS buttons, it's the same technique. So after I have laid um, this um, PCB down there in the cutout, then I have to align the uh, height of um, the laser head to the surface of the PCB and then I can engrave these lines, the top line. And when I finish the uh, top, then I can flip it over and engrave the back side of this panel. And then I have to clean this, but we come to this after the step. Directly after engraving the top side, I will remove all the dust from this layer here. And I will do it with the backside of the sponge and a little bit of soap here. And you can rub with this sponge gently above the surface. This won't um, remove any uh, of the unengraved lacquer here. After engraving and cleaning the PCB from both sides, I will etch it here in the etching machine. It will be etched from both sides at the one time. And um, when you are doing this, you have to take care that you don't over etch the PCB because then you will end up with um, broken lines here. After the etching process, I will clean away all the lacquer with acetone. It's really difficult to see if the etching process is finished on a double-sided PCB, especially uh, when you don't remove most of the copper and uh, only those uh, thin lines here. On a single-sided PCB you can uh, hold a flashlight behind it and then you can uh, see if everything is removed. But now this will be a surprise for me too. When you wipe it away with the acetone, then um, don't rub too much times on the, the same place of this towel here, because then you get into danger that you rub 
the lacquer into the small grooves here. So just wipe away a little bit and then use uh, the next part of the toe. But again, a failure. Some parts of this PCB came out really good and I still think this can be a really good method to make your own PCB at home when you have this equipment. Maybe not with these small uh, lines on the PCB, maybe a little bit wider lines and maybe with more simpler PCBs. Maybe just uh, single-sided uh, PCBs and not so complex ones. I will keep on with this method and use it uh, for other parts in the cockpit where I'm in need of a PCB. So, but the end of this story, I took the Gerber files that I designed for this PCB and sent them to a professional manufacturer. And here we are. A bunch of professional made PCBs, absolutely perfect. Okay, these are professionals. I think when they don't know how to make a PCB, who else? So, absolutely professional made, no failures, and they come with a minimum order quantity of five pieces. And to get these five pieces, I've paid something around 24 bucks, uh, where only six bucks are the production cost of this uh, PCBs and the rest is uh, the shipping fee. So, so when you think uh, just about the costs, it isn't worth uh, to make a PCB at home. My dream still is that I can go into my basement and at the end of the evening I come back with a finished PCB in my hands. But as I have said, maybe this can work uh, for simply PCBs, but not for these ones. So for future projects, I will design them uh, ahead so um, that I can uh, pre-plan the PCBs for upcoming projects and order them so that I don't have to pay the uh, shipping costs for every uh, single video I'm making here. And after I finally have a working PCB, I can place all the components onto it. I installed the ICs on the front, I had to make an additional cutout of the foam. Now the panel is installed and we can go on to the configuration work in ProSim and MobiFlight. Some configurations I have prepared already here and other ones I will do together with you so that I can explain a little bit more to you. Let's have a look first into the configuration in ProSim and you can do this again in the config and configuration tab and on the combined config and here in the electric category you will find the numerical category. This is where we can uh, configure all our seven segment displays. The other switches here, uh, the rotary switches and the on off switches, you can find under switches. Um, I think you should know this already. 
So let's look at the numerical section here. And down here, I already have prepared the offsets for these seven segment displays. These segments are combined to five groups. You can see this already up here. Um, the upper left here, which is the DC ammeter, the upper right, which is uh, the CPS frequencies. We have the lower left, which is the DC volts. The ACMs are located in the lower center here. There we have it. And the AC volts, which is in the lower right. And to all these, I have already assigned the offsets. You can see I'm using different sizes of offsets. For these three here, I'm using an 8-bit unsigned offset. And this is because I have to think about how big are the numbers I want to transport from the simulator to, uh, to ProSim and now here uh, to MobiFlight. And all these three values in the uh, lower line are values that can be represented by numbers from 0 up to 225. And this is the range that an 8-bit unsigned offset can represent. Down here, we come to a 16-bit signed offset. Signed means that I can uh, show also negative values. And even if I think with an 8-bit signed uh, offset, I would be able to present uh, negative values from minus 127 up to positive 127. It hasn't worked here. And so even if I'm only showing very small negative numbers, it worked better for me when I use this 16-bit signed offset. So I have some offsets uh, left here and so I can use them. Let's come to the configurations in MobiFlight. First of all, we have to declare um, the devices. And for this, you go to Extras, Settings. And in the MobiFlight modules, I find my um, devices in the Arduino A. So it is connected to the A Arduino. And down here, I have declared a device that's called ELEC segment for the segments of the electrical display. And this is all you have to declare for all these 14 seven segment displays. They are represented by three pins of the Arduino, the DIN, CS and clock here. And the number uh, shows how many ICs I have built in my uh, PCB. There are two controllers built in and every one of them can control up to eight seven segment displays. In my case, the controller number one uh, controls the upper five segments and the number two controls all the eight segments that are uh, placed in the lower line of the electrical display. And here in my outputs configuration, you can see five configurations that are um, assigned to the ELEC segment. And this is for every number that will be shown on the segments. So the upper left is one configuration, the upper right is one configuration and so on. Let's have a look here uh, at the first configuration, the upper left here. And let's see what I have done here. In the sim variable tab, I have inserted the offset and how big it is. In this case, it has two bytes. It is a 16-bit signed offset. You can left everything else untouched here. And in the display tab here, I have to declare that it is connected to the Arduino A. It is a display module. And which display module? There's only one. It is the Alex segment. And it is um, controlled by number one controller. Then I have to say how many numbers are connected to this uh, controller. And these are six numbers here. 
And now for this configuration, the upper left number, there are three numbers and I have to uh, say which displays are in use. And these are the first three displays here. And when I then click on the test button, I see that the upper left three displays are lighting up and showing the numbers one, two and three. If there would be more displays and you would have uh, marked in here more, then uh, there would be more numbers shown up. So this is the way how you can check if your displays are working in general. Let's have another look to a number of the bottom line here. For example, uh, the lower center, which is my A34 configuration. You can see here at the sim variables, I have inverted the offset again, but this time the size and bytes is only one because it is an eight bit offset. On the display tab, you see it is also assigned to the Alex segment and this time to controller number two. Controller number two controls eight digits. So I have inserted here the eight and these are the middle three here. And this time these are digits three to five, which belongs to the lower center number. And when I here click test now, the lower center number is lighting up. So let's try a first run together with ProSim. I click on run, have prepared running in the background. And we can see a lot of numbers here. Let's compare the values to um, the values ProSim is giving us here. And we can see this here in the electric category. Down here we find all the numbers and you see the lower center is a minus one which means when we compare this now here to the uh, pros and displays here uh, minus one means there is nothing no number is lighting up we can see only the left and right number of the bottom line should show a zero so and when we compare this here to the prosim system numbers, we can see um, the lower left is zero, the lower right is zero, but all other numbers here are minus one, so should be shown. So how can we achieve this in MobiFlight now? For this, we have to uh, modify our configuration. And let's start uh, with the upper two first we can see there comes a minus one here and we go into the configuration. And on the compare tab, we activate a comparison and that says if the current value that is coming is equal to minus one, I give a blank out here. And the blank means no number is shown. So if I do this and you can see I have a Mobi flight still running and it is updating immediately what is showing on the display then you can see two zeros are shown. It has only taken away the first number and to let all the numbers disappear we can use a padding and this can be set here in the display tab. We use a padding and this means when only one number is shown, it is uh, going to the left and every numbers on the right are filled with these zeros here. But we don't want to have it filled with zeros, we want to have it um, to filled with nothing in this case, and this will be spaces. So when we do this, then we can see the number is appearing. We can see the input value is a minus one here, the output value is nothing. That's what we want to have. So the other one, the upper right, is here, also a minus one, and we modify it so that the minus one is giving out nothing, and we activate the padding with spaces. And it is away. 
The padding is also the method that will help us in the lower left and lower right position here because these should only show a zero and we don't want to have more than one zero. So we activate spaces again and we can see a zero is shown, a zero should be shown, but only one. And this will also be set here at the A35, which is my lower right. Spaces. And we are nearly at our goal. The last thing, the lower center here, it shows a 255. And this is because this is an unsigned offset. This doesn't know negative values, so no negative value will come in here. But this isn't a problem. A value of 255 won't um, be here in real life at the AC meter. And so we can take this number as the value that should blank out our number. So let's go into the configuration to the comparison tab and apply a comparison that says when the current value is equal to 255, then give out a blank. And to ensure that no other numbers will be shown, we activate the padding with spaces. And now we can test our configuration and if all the switches are working. Let me go over here a little bit. So let's test the galley switch off and on this works the battery goes off and on this is working so where do we have power i have the engines running in the background so let's see what comes in to generator one so the rotary switch is working and we have shown a 401 in the upper right there should be no numbers on the lower left and center um, that says in the ProSim displays. But when we have a look here at ProSim systems, uh, then we can see the lower right shows the 91, the lower center shows the 115. I think the values in ProSim system are right and not here in ProSim displays. I will let this open here so we can check this in the background too so 24 in the lower left this is right the minus 5 comes up in the upper left and this is right too minus 33 so everything is working Finally, this episode of the Overhead Project comes to an end. And to say it a little bit more dramatically, it's just a small hole in the overhead panel, but a big hole for me. I have uploaded you all the needed files to route out or laser out your own panel segments and also the Gerber files so that you can make or order your own PCB. When I covered the PCB with a foam, I realized that at my first tries, I have mounted the ICs on the back side of the panel. And so covering the PCB with foam was more easy and I had to make cutouts for these ICs. And so I redesigned the Gerber files a little bit and placed the ICs on the back side again. So it will be more easy for you to build this. And if you want to build your own overhead at home or maybe some parts for it, like an overhead panel, then you should think about becoming a member of my website. You will find many more files on the download page in the member section. And again, I have to move to one of the remaining sections of the overhead panel. And if you don't want to miss this episode, then subscribe to my channel to stay informed about any upcoming new video from me. So I hope We'll see us soon back on the flight deck.